you know, all the uncertainties of the market. So you have labor, you have, um, you know, food costs, you have a different specialty, you have quality, you have to, because all this is, no, it's manufacturing the end. Mm. So you have different quality of, of ingredients and we were talking about churn and we came up with the concept of, of bad pizza, right? So we use the concept of a bad pizza as a proxy for churn. So you would say, typical question we ask is, okay, of a hundred of your customers receiving a bad pizza, how many of them would not buy from you in the next year? And there is always like, you know, it's between, I don't know, there's always a figure depending on, on the brand you're talking to. And uh, this has been very, very positive for us, like re reducing this amount of bad pizza and uh, anticipating um, or reducing churn. And then the, 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 the interesting part also is if you know that this customer is getting a bad pizza, um, can we automate like a coupon, like a free ice cream or something to, you know, okay, we know we messed it up, but maybe you want to stay with us because we're good people. You know, the data is one thing, but then on the other side of it, even within franchises, like every franchisee kind of runs their business differently. Yep. And then when you're looking at different concepts, every concept is so unique and different within the restaurant industry, like Emmanuel's you know, pizzas, right? Even pizzas vary so much within, you know, the industry. So it's, it's, it's so, so one of the challenges we always face is just how varied everyone's operations are and how you can standardize a product or service that can, you know, appeal to a large restaurant group. Yeah, you know, one of the prevailing thoughts has been dumb pipeline, smart system. Yeah. So as long as we can share it back and forth in as common a format as possible, it makes it simpler for the exchange of whatever else. For example, if I wanted to get more information about a customer and the possible churn on it, I'd like to be able to send you data in this particular format that you subscribe to and that we all agree makes the same thing and that the new stuff you're sending back to me as well we need a standard for that too because if you're going to work with me you're obviously working with other people also and let's just make it simpler for everybody because i'm lazy i don't want to reinvent the wheel every time i get stuff from a new system but what i'm seeing and, and i'd love to validate here is you know restaurants are struggling with staffing we all know that uh, also, not only are they struggling with just team members, but they're struggling with management personnel as well, right? So typically, you know, managers are getting promoted up maybe quicker than they would have before. And, you know, there's a lot of times where restaurants have managers that aren't necessarily as experienced as maybe they used to be in the past. And so they're not quite as, you know, have quite the savvy that some of the more experienced managers would have. And it's compounded by the fact that they may be short staffed and not even able to be a manager on duty. They may be locked in a position where they can't, you know, actually be a manager because they're expediting or doing, they're doing something else, especially, you know, in a QSR space. So like one of the things that I think, you know, machine learning and or AI could come into play is being kind of that virtual manager or virtual coach that's like prompting that manager along throughout the day. So for Absolutely. example, something's happening. Yeah, you've got, you got something happening in the restaurant. You've got your forecast out there. You're either ahead of the forecast or you're behind the forecast or something has happened that impacts what's going on in the restaurant. and that manager is going to be locked in place and may not have the savvy either a may not have the skill set to pick up on what's happening in the restaurant to take corrective action soon enough or b may not have time to go back and find or look at a dashboard or, or pull it up and you look at a back office bc so i'd like to see something like prompting them along right like so hey things are not where we thought they were going to be you're going to get some sort of push notification or some sort of you know punt you know poke in the side that says hey something's happening and you need to take action or you're going to you know, lose X amount of dollars. So it's almost like a virtual coach, coach that never sleeps, virtual manager, something along those lines that uh, from a back of house perspective, I think could be potentially helpful. So loss of institutional knowledge in the industry, your, your manager that used to stick his head out the, the door and say like, it's a Friday night and the weather's looking good. And I see some traffic, you know, let's, <laughs> let's, you know, bake four more pies. That guy's Love like it. no longer around. You've got Billy right. been on the job for six months. Correct. I think the best analogy we have is like, you know, Running a restaurant, there's so many ways to lose money. It's like having a cup with a bunch of little holes in it that are just, you know, bleeding out money. And managers wake up every day and they make 50 to 100 decisions trying to plug those holes. And they make those same decisions every day. So how can you provide them the right answers to those decisions in advance so they're able to focus on the customer and not all these little minor things? Because it's the volume of those decisions. I mean, if they had the time, they can figure them out. They just don't have the bandwidth. Right. Where does AI kind of provide the most benefit with the least downside? 
Um, and what and what is AI best at? And, and sort of like what are humans best at? Um, I think I've always been, you know, like, and, you know, with N Pizza, we were doing SMS was like a baseline of what we were doing. And when we looked at something like the way that order AI works with Jets experience, right? Like it's, it's an initial NLP recognition at the point of an origination, but then it goes right into the same sort of web ordering flow. It like populates a, a pizza, like an assumed pizza into like an ordering flow and then everything else still follows that same kind of web-based interface to complete your order, right? Because that's the most efficient way of, of completing an order through an order flow. One of the things that I've been most impressed by, it's not usually talked about in the same breadth as generative AI, although it is absolutely generative AI, is Spotify wrapped. Um, you know, if you're a Spotify user, uh, which I have been for many, many years now, um, you know, the Spotify wrapped, if you don't know what Spotify wrapped is, you need to Google it, spend a little bit of time learning what that is. Um, because basically it's a report that they give to you where they look at your data over the course of a calendar year, uh, how many times you played certain songs, what genre those were, uh, new artists, old artists, up-tempo, down-tempo, uh, every which way you could stratify that data, they slice it up and serve it back to you in a, in a fully baked dish that's just delicious. And so, uh, you know, it's uh, from a rest from a restaurant point of view. It's 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 actually it's, or anybody else. It's just kind of inspiring to think about you know how they use data, how they please their customers uh, by sort of holding the mirror up back at them, and how that could be done elsewhere. And and ChatGPT is nothing but a story in that, and everything generative really comes down to being that at its core. Um, you know, I uh, one of the things that we normally uh, do test is, you know, how it um, responds to negations, for example, right? So, you know, if you say, uh, you know, a New York City is, uh, you know, and, and then it would tell you what it is. But if you say New York City is not, and then that's where a lot of these models struggle because they are obviously picking up patterns specific to what it is. Um, and um, and so, you know, I think it just like like every language model uh, there are biases and you know so so one can one once you start using it you see some biases in terms of mm -hmm. um, you know uh, it, it tending to pick up content in a in a you know a, more in a certain uh, you know more based on where the data is coming from um, and this idea of moving more and more towards asking questions of data in a way that is where where the system does more work and does more inference work on top of what you're trying to pull out of it. So when you start thinking in terms of, as, as we look at operationalizing something like a chat GPT model, whether we're talking about the literal AI itself or whether we're talking about just this concept of how you go into your data, whether it's, whether it's open source data or whether it's actually starting to think about like how you produce your own data so that it can be accessed and used through these kinds of models. The questions of things like, you know, what's my sales forecast for next week? Like being, being able to kind of like question your data as opposed to access it through like what I would say traditional analytical methodologies. The idea of using like previously you used to go needing to like pull data out and do the analysis as opposed to I, we had members of our team do things like, hey, can you write a Python script to do X, Y, and Z? And the model would just give you back the basics of a Python script and you could like adjust from there. But the idea of like being able to ask questions through a natural language model that then brings back, maybe not the medication you should take, Jay, but like the yeah. possibility of like a starting point for how the system can help you think about like acting on it. I think it it's a fast forward in a lot of ways to what we currently do in terms of accessing information and data within our organization. So I think there's something there that it's a paradigm shift in what we think data is a lot able to understand and deliver back to us in the form of value. Voice AI, chat, um, you know, NLP can be can can get really clunky when you start getting into like trying to deal with real human problems um, in a way that I feel like like automated kitchen AI is almost the kitchens are almost built to be AI because they're so structured there, and especially if you're at scale in a restaurant, you're building your kitchens as similar as possible. You're almost built to kind of do those kind of computational AIs as a matter of doing business. So where are those high leverage moments to put in voice AI? 
versus where are those high leverage moments of putting in computational and tracking AIs against that. So I feel like for each brand, they're trying to figure out each thing. We never actually went down the point of throwing much NLP into our, um, into our chats, in our text messaging, because we kept it very personal. But we found like a lot of value in in automating other, adding AI into other parts of our in our, our business, such as scheduling and and um, you know uh, um, inventory management, things like that. And um, the other point I wanted to make was, uh, uh, you know, with a lot of the um, uh, personalization aspect, you know. Uh, we, for example, on the phone side, uh, and, and this is not just us, but you know, there are other providers that do similar things. Uh, we, we were earlier, let's say for a phone AI, recognizing the customer through just the phone number. But then we realized that if we personalize it, we have, you know, the phone number is not enough because someone else may be using the same number. And so then we uh, started adding voice biometrics to it. So now it's a combination of voice biometrics and the person. Where can you know, and, and there's countless other examples, um, you know, and so it's it's somebody's going to be the guinea pig. And, and I did see the thing about McDonald's. I also don't know what the resolution was, but uh, McDonald's was early to this ball game yeah. because when they bought a print day, I think it was like, what, 18, 19, you know, that was one of the earlier acquisitions in this space. And um, people thought, what the hell are these guys doing? Uh, people actually wrote articles that basically said, what the hell are these guys doing? And, uh, you know, they've been uh, proven right because that's the direction they were out, you know, a period of uh, three or four actual years. And then in dog years, a whole lot more than that. When you account for technology acceleration caused by the pandemic, uh, they're way out in front. So um, so anyway, yeah, I, I, I look at this stuff and, and I think that your slide here does a really good job of illustrating the market movement. It's undeniable. And uh, you can just imagine the use cases we're going to be learning about uh, because all of these all of these uh, restaurants have different clientele uh, and they have different products and they have different upsell strategies and they have different this that and the other uh, we're going to do a lot of learning over the next five years